Well, welcome back to the sixth graders. <coughs> We're uh, on session number two here of our painting project. And uh, as I recall, uh, when we left off yesterday or our previous session, we had gotten to uh, five shapes down here. We only need to put in ten shapes in this area and we'll have our 40 shapes and then once we get our 40 shapes in uh, we can actually start painting which I anticipate will happen during this actual session today. So uh, you will need to have some paint ready uh, before you get going and that uh, today you're only going to need red, yellow and blue and some rinse water and of course a paper towel in order to make all this happen properly for you. Okay, uh, so we left off with five uh, we've got a lot of clouds and uh, angular stuff working in here, so it seems to me uh, one of the things that we really are missing is uh, the curved object, which we repeated down in here. So I'm going to simply uh, kind of divide off this space so that it kind of maybe has some more curves in it. I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of awkward sometimes to, to work on a camera like this. So here, if we take and just curve from here to here, okay, so wherever this little notch down is, this little uh, square down, if we just draw a long curve from one to the other, such as this, then that gives it a little bit of interesting motion there as well, too. So all I've got to do then is, of course, like I've been doing, go back with the marker and bold that line. You don't have to use a marker but I'm making a video and so you have to be able to see what I'm doing. So this would be shape number six in there and that's kind of neat. Now if we were to go for instance uh, from this corner right here and try to uh, touch the top of the dot now I don't know about that that could make things look funny. Here's what we should do. We should draw from the corner of the diamond here we should draw a curved line as well and this curved line from the corner of the diamond will curve up and touch the bottom of the line we just made a moment ago okay and that's uh, adding a little bit of curvaceous uh, motion here okay now when we do that what happens is this shape down here then becomes shape number seven uh, so, that means we've got to probably divide it a couple more times and we're going to have our ten shapes. Now this is an interesting kind of situation right here. If we were to go from this corner right here and curve, uh, oh, we'll, now we'll curve that, I like that outward curve. So we're going to try to curve from this corner right here in a curving pat fashion until we hit right here. Okay? And uh, that's so we're going to curve, 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 curve until we hit on just on the point of that if we can make that happen. If you can't make that happen, then you'll just have to hit uh, on this line somewhere around in there. Okay, and once again, let me go back and bold my line. Alright, now, that right in the middle now is shape number eight. Uh, let's uh, do a little bit more uh, divisional work here. This is an easy one to do. Let's just go from uh, the middle of the uh, little square down area. So we'll go right from the middle of that and we'll just draw straight down and until it hits the... Uh, we might have to actually tilt it a bit until it hits that diamond shape right on the top. So from the middle of the little square notch down to the top of the diamond, straight line, and that will give us uh, shape number nine right here, see? And since that appears to be, there's a couple of large shapes, shape number nine and shape number seven are both rather large. Uh, however, I think what we're going to have to do here is because the way the painting is set up is that we're going to have to cut off, we're going to have to go from the bottom of the diamond shape and we're going to uh, curve it, kind of continue this curve right here. So from the bottom of the diamond shape, we're going to curve it until it just goes right off the bottom of the paper. And that should be, it, it should be slightly curved. I know it looks a little bit straight on the video here, but it should be slightly curved like that. 
And I believe what that will do then is make that shape number 10. If this was shape number 7 and 8 and 9, then this would be shape number 10. Okay, now uh, you don't need to have the numbers on your, uh, on your drawing. Uh, you will really struggle when it comes time to paint over top of those sometimes. Uh, however, uh, I'm going to leave the numbers on for my instructional purposes here and I will paint over them. Uh, so how we're going to be doing this uh, and in the drawing, excuse me, the painting lecture, you would have been explained all of this to you, but we're going to go with the primary colors up here in the corner. And then over here, we're going to have, excuse me, that would be a tinting scale. So there's primary colors, secondary colors down here, tertiary colors right here, and then we do what's called a tinting scale where things get lighter and lighter and then in the middle we do a shading scale where they get darker and darker and then we do some complementary colors in the middle of the bottom which is uh, the idea that colors are opposite colors and then we go over here and we do analogous colors which would be colors that all uh, have a common color they're like three colors next to each other on the color wheel and then we go over here and we do our triads which is any three colors that are arranged into a triangle and then in the very middle we would do our warm and cool colors uh, at that time and so uh, we're going to it goes primary, secondary, tertiary, tinting scale, shading scale, complements, analogous colors, triads, and then warms and cools. And that's how we put it together. It really is quite simple when you know how it is done. Uh, however, if you've never done this, it can be really quite complex. Now, I'm going to be using <coughs> a, uh, a very simple brush here. So I use the same materials that I have the students use. <coughs> and that would be uh, a brush from a uh, sixth grade painting kit. Okay, so if you're a uh, oh man, sorry about that. I just hit the whole camera. That's not good at all. Okay, so uh, if you've been in my uh, class much, you've probably seen a brush like this. They come actually with a watercolor kit that I use with the seventh graders. All right, you're going to need some rinse water. You're going to need red, yellow, and blue. And we are going to uh, get started here. So let me get my colors out and set my rinse water off to the side. So we're going to need red, yellow, and blue. These are the primary colors. And the primary colors are important because we can make almost every other color from them. Now I'm going to put, I'm going to have this setting where you can see it. However, you should not do this. You should have your paint off to the side somewhere where you can, uh, you know, not get it into your painting. I'm pretty tidy about this, but you could find yourself struggling to keep the paint, you know, literally on the painting sometimes. Alright, so we're going to start with our primary colors, which are going to go up in this area of our painting. And so the primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. So we're going to pick out, I would say, let's start with some yellow. Well, let's start with some blue. Because blue is always a good color to start with. It covers up uh, mistakes. So in this w instance, we're going to simply paint in the blue all the way up in this corner right here. Now there is a system to doing this, and that's why I'm talking you through it. And it is a painting, no doubt. However, it's a project more than anything. And so as a result of that, there's certain uh, rules and regulations that I want you to abide by as we go through this painting project. Now, if you're painting on a piece of poster board, uh, you uh, are probably going to do okay. If you're trying to paint on a piece of paper uh, with heavy paint of any sort, you're probably going to struggle to get that paint to actually stick to the board. Uh, so, uh, my advice for you is try to get some red, yellow, and blue, but, you know, like poster paint or tempera paint. Uh, acrylic paint will work if you must have that for an e-lesson. Uh, in the physical classroom, we would use t tempera paint. Uh, and so, uh, that's, it, it dries very quickly and makes for some really nice uh, artwork. Now, uh, if, as you can see here, uh, we've got the blue in, and it's a little bit, sometimes the paint is a little thin, and so you have to go back sometimes and just, you know, double coat it. That's just the way painting is done, so we'll uh, 
let's put a few more, you know, because I'm big on opacity, right? I think it's important to have opacity in your work. But I'm also only working with the very, very end of the brush, okay? The nose or the toe, as some people call it. So you've got to really, uh, if you put too much paint on, it's more difficult to take it off. Uh, if you put on a little bit at a time, then that's good too. So trying to learn how much paint to actually put onto a surface is difficult, and how much paint to hold on to the brush at any one time, that's the hardest part of learning how to paint, in my opinion. Alright, so that blue looks pretty good. I may go back at some point in time and maybe, uh, you know, coat it again if I'm not satisfied with the opacity. Now, it's really important that when we are uh, painting, especially in group lessons, that you rinse out your brush completely each time, because you're probably only going to have one, maybe two brushes. And as we go through our project, and I have a paper towel on the sidelines right here, and I have a uh, small cup of water, okay, in the physical classroom we would have uh, more implements than this. So I'm constantly taking my paintbrush, and I, I don't bang it against the edge of the cup because it splatters water, colored water everywhere, and I'm always very carefully cleaning that paintbrush out and drying it and trying to keep that nice point on it, okay? So... <clears throat> that helps us continue to make a, a quality painting. Okay, so we're making pretty good progress here. So what we're going to do next is I try to keep all of these uh, colors uh, co-located with each other. Uh, so all the primaries should be near each other. And in this case, that's going to be, let's go with yellow next. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, yellow is just really kind of more of a test to see if you've got your brush clean than much of anything else. Uh, if you haven't cleaned your brush out, you're going to get some sort of unusual green colors developing there. Now, yellow is a very, it's a very, very weak color when it comes to its uh, concealing power, and so that means we've got to probably double coat it. Uh, now, in the classroom, we will be using temper paint and that temper paint dries really quite quickly uh, and it's a little bit more opaque than the paint that I'm using right now uh, and that's good because when that temper paint dries quickly you can immediately within just a minute or two you can put a uh, another coat of uh, yellow over top of it so Yellow is just one of those colors that it almost always takes more of it than you think it does, and it should. Uh, when we mix colors, you'll notice that as well. Uh, the ratios for mixing uh, colors that contain yellow always contain more yellow uh, than you would think it needs. Uh, but if you don't put it in, you get a different type of a color altogether. Okay, let's see what we've got going here. That looks pretty good, too. That looks real good. So I'm happy to say that the colors are coming through on the projector and the camera very, uh, very much like the actual colors I'm seeing in front of me here. And that's a good thing. Uh, sometimes when we do color projections and we're doing instructions such as this, what happens is that you uh, really um, can't see the legitimate colors as they're being applied. All right, so let's move on there. So we've got our blue and our yellow. Those are our two, uh, two of our three primaries. And I've chosen to hold out on the red, the third part of our primary color there, because I thought it was appropriate to put it in the side of the heart that is uh, on the right. And so that way we'll have our primaries all touching each other and leave ourselves space at the top for another requirement. Okay, so if we take uh, some red, and uh, red has got a lot of concealing power, at least this red does. Uh, there are different types of red. There are, uh, of course, there's different types of paint. So my opinion is <clears throat> that you try to, you can always add more paint. Learning how much paint to put on and how much paint to carry on the brush is complicated. And it takes a while to learn it. So brush control is not as easily done as it may seem when demonstrated by somebody who knows what they are doing. So in this case, I understand that you may be struggling with figuring out how much paint to load onto the brush, how much uh, 
how dirty the brush gets, how far up, you know, on the bristles. If you look at my paintbrush, I'm still, I don't have paint all the way up the handle. I don't have paint all over the place. I've only got it on the working end of the brush. And uh, this way, you may make mistakes, but you make them slowly instead of rapidly. And uh, when you make mistakes really quickly, they can compound themselves, meaning they get worse the more you try to fix them. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a uh, painting is a. Uh, it's an unusual activity. It many times is uh, very uh, relaxing, and then sometimes it's extremely stress-inducing. So um, right now it seems pretty relaxing, but by the time we're done with the lesson, you may not be so relaxed. So sixth grade painting lesson is always entertaining. All right. So many times when you're <coughs> painting close to a line you have to hold your breath and in your case your lines will be made with pencils right and so they're very thin lines and you have to paint right up next to that line <clears throat> since my lines are made with a marker uh, I get a little bit more uh, wiggle room uh, than you do about getting the paint into the next shape or compartment Okay, that looks pretty good right there. Deep red, very deep red. Crimsony almost. Okay, I'm going to try to smooth that out. <coughs> and the uh, and the studio here, it's uh, I can see all the little marks in it that the paintbrush left behind. Okay, so, not bad. Here we are. Uh, we've finished the drawing already this period. We've also started the uh, painting already so that's great so we've finished our primary colors and so now we're going to move down to this area and do our secondary colors now uh, the reason that we're only using red yellow blue black and white and it's funny because this is the same colors that the sixth graders use in their design project is because you can make all the other colors from these colors if you use black and white to go along with it you can make an enormous range of colors and that's uh, what the color wheel kind of represents uh, that we discussed in the lecture. And so when we mix primary colors together in equal amounts, we end up with secondary colors. So in this exercise, if we were to mix blue and yellow together, we would get green. If we mix yellow and red together, we get orange. And if we mix red and blue together we get violet so green orange and violet are the uh, secondary colors now we're going to in the physical classroom one class will get a card that has paint on it and they have to take care of that card of paint uh, because the next class will also be using it and so we mix our colors on index cards like this and so I will demonstrate on here the colors and then paint them in and uh, we are going to be using uh, shapes down in this corner right here for our secondary colors. So it's important uh, to know how to mix colors if you're going to make quality paintings. So let's get started here. So the first color we would like to make is green. And we're looking for uh, kind of a forest green or a John Deere green color. Uh, not too yellowy, uh, not too dark. So in this case, it usually takes three yellows. So if we scoop off with a paintbrush, three scoops of yellow. And if you had an extra paintbrush, that's what we usually use in the uh, actual classroom. Okay, now I've got to clean that brush out because that extra yellow will cause residue that I uh, might not be able to control when I'm mixing the colors. So, and then I have to dry out my paintbrush so I don't end up with runny paint. Now I'm going to take one good scoop of this blue and I'm going to add these together and I'm going to stir them into a little tight little pile just like as if I was using my paintbrush like a broom okay and uh, if you do it this way you'll get a uh, a good little puddle of green paint if you just smear it around on the card everywhere what's going to happen is that you will end up with uh, the perfect color but it will dry before you can get it onto your painting so we have to like scoop it all into the middle 
when we're when we are mixing it and get all of the little strands of color out of it okay so that there's no yellow and blue strands showing now I think that I'm going to need a little bit more blue in this to make it the color that I want which is true green permanent green so I'm rinsing out my brush again and it should be John Deere green or forest green this is a little bit on the yellow side if you ask me so I'm going to take just a little bit more blue and I'm going to put it in there so color mixing is not a, a precise exact science uh, to get the color that you desire may take a couple of attempts okay I'm going to say that one is going to be fantastic alright so I'm going to turn my card around here so you can see what I'm doing over here we're going to take our green color that we've made and we're going to place it let's see it seems like we've got a lot of it so we're going to put it all down in this lower left corner uh, around the coffee cup now since there is yellow in our green that means that it may uh, not be completely opaque and so we may have to uh, give it another coat there as we go through the painting project and but some people uh, have uh, you know just the, the touch with the paintbrush that allows them to get almost complete opacity now if you can do it we want to place that right in the handle of the coffee mug some of this green because kind of what we're representing here is a bit of a tabletop and we would be able to see you know through that hole in the coffee mug right and so you just got to be patient sometimes you got to hold your breath when you're trying to do tight control work just hold it and let it like halfway out while you're doing your control work and then move on to the bigger areas which are easier more easily painted but still require concentration so you can't simply just rush through it and kind of scribble it in there now when somebody such as myself is painting it looks very easy and I've been doing this for a very long time and so I can produce painting a little bit faster than most students can I do I do meet the occasional student who's really a good producer but uh, that's, uh, you know, at the sixth grade level, that's a rarity. However, I, I do run into those types of students, and, uh, you know, they're kind of just gifted students that way, artistically speaking, that is. All right, this green is looking pretty good. It's showing up on the projector, uh, honestly, better than it appears on the, uh, on the actual painting right now, so I'm fussing with it. Okay, that's uh, looking pretty good. So that's what happens when we mix together uh, yellow and blue. And as you noticed, it should, according to color theory, equal amounts of yellow and equal amounts of blue should give you permanent green. Uh, however, what that really means is equal amounts of light. And so that means by because we're working with paint, paint merely reflects light. It doesn't make its own light. So sometimes we have to increase the amount of one color in order to get um, the same amount, an equal amount of reflected light. That's, it's kind of strange uh, scientifically, but that's what it means. So uh, to get an equal amount of light uh, for our color to turn green, we must reflect more yellow from these particular types of paints and that means you have to mess with the formula for how you make the paint and that's all there is to it uh, but the color theory for violets and oranges and green is that you use equal amounts of the primary colors but that doesn't mean it, like one teaspoon of each that would not necessarily give you the color you wanted it means reflecting an equal amount of the wavelength of that particular color of light and in this case we're using paint so we have to alter our formula a bit okay now that looks pretty good I think we're going to leave that one alone maybe get that corner there if I'm brave enough okay it looks pretty good okay so um, it's flashing I, uh, I've always wondered why that happens alright well we've got now uh, we made four colors in one day uh, almost all the time if we can simply get through uh, four or five colors in one day that's a huge achievement uh, now I've 
in the physical classroom, we're making good time here, but in the physical classroom, it would take significantly more time. As I went around the classroom and, and showed people how to mix their colors properly and checked what they were doing so that they, <coughs> excuse me, were getting good results. Okay, now let's get ready to move on here. I'm going to move my, uh, I'm going to move my index card here uh, to a slightly different area right now. I'm going to put it up here for now. And our next color that we're going to make <coughs> is going to be orange. And uh, in this case, we're using yellow again. And so just like when we made the green, we had to put an additional amount of yellow in it. I'm going to bet the same thing will happen this time. So if that's the case, let's go ahead and find out. So I'm going to say let's take three scoops of the yellow. Generous scoops, ladies and gentlemen. If you use little bitty dots or scoops of your paint, you might get the right color, but you're probably not going to have enough to uh, actually fill in the portion of your painting that you need with any opacity. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, if that happens, you will have to remix that color, and it just doesn't work very well sometimes. So we have three yellows. Now we're going to take uh, one generous scoop of red, and just like we did over here, we're going to mix it together in the middle of the car, in the middle of the puddle. And we're going to do our very best to scrape it into a tiny little pile of orange paint. And if that uh, occurs, then we're good to go. The target color is kind of a pumpkin orange. And this one's looking pretty good right off the, right off the bat. Okay, i got to keep scooping it into the middle and moving it around so I don't have any strands of yellow or red showing in it. And if I keep it in a tight little pile, I should come out with like pumpkin -y orange. Now we're right underneath the light, so over there, that's more of the color we're looking for. So three scoops of yellow and one, one scoop of red should yield pumpkin orange. Now, um, I'm thinking that mine might actually be just a little bit on the red side. So I'm going to clean my brush a bit. And I'm going to pick up some yellow again, and I'm going to add just the smallest amount of yellow into my orange here because I'm not quite satisfied with the precise color I got. And I can already tell that that makes a difference. And so scraping it together, tight little pile there. Okay, so I can see that that's made a difference already. So we're going to take this orange and we're going to place it in what would be shape number 10 on my painting there. Make sure that your brush is loaded with, with a good amount of paint, but not all the way up the handle. It may take more than one coat of paint to fill this shape in. So you should be able to find the shape easily since we drew the project together. So this orange, uh, and this paint, this orange looks pretty good, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with it now. But this paint will dry a brighter color than it goes on uh, when it initially is still wet paint. So you have a little bit of faith sometimes, the perfect color that you're looking for, you may have achieved it by following the directions, but your eyes will deceive you based on the lighting in the room and also the fact that when the paint dries it brightens up. In this case, this is looking pretty good. So this has traditionally been a painting project that we've been doing for many, many years uh, in middle school here. And uh, I like to do this particular project. It, it reinforces all of the basic shapes that we have made in the design project and also in the drawing unit. And furthermore, it um, is not really representational. There's things in it that you understand and you un and recognize, but we're not actually doing it from observation. We're simply doing a color exercise that's allowing us to uh, be able to learn how to do color mixing and also how to control the brush. And that's really what this is. And it comes out looking really quite cool, though, once we get all of the 
requirements put into it. So it just it's better to work slow and accurately than it is to work fast and recklessly. So if you're following this lesson and you're keeping up with me, and I think I'm working kind of slow personally, but I'm trying to be thorough in my instruction. Alright, that looks pretty good so far. Nicely right up against the edge. Good control. Sometimes you gotta hold your breath. It can be risky. You gotta get something over top of shape number 10 there that's showing through my paint. Let it dry a bit and try to recoat it, maybe. I'll come back to it here in a moment. So, you really want to be able to let out on the point of the brush. You can see I'm not using, uh, I do not have my hand gripped way, way, way down here. I'm holding my hand up here where I can see each time I apply the paint, I can actually see that the moment that the paint is applied to the place I'm attempting to put it, that's what I'm trying to see. That's called visual feedback. You really need that visual feedback when you're making art. Just like with the pencil, you should let out on the point of the pencil a little bit too so that you can get that moment of visual feedback. You can clearly see when you make the mark. And that's how you know whether or not you're making mistakes or not. Alright, I'm going to rinse this out. I'm pretty satisfied with that, although I still may come back and try to cover up that numeral 10. Uh, on your project, you should have erased all of that stuff if you made uh, markings in there, if you uh, wrote in the numbers. I'm simply doing this so that we can reference the exact same shape, and in doing that, we can all stay on the same portion of the painting that way. And uh, So it's looking pretty good so far. All right, I think we got time to maybe try to mix up one more today. And by getting through these uh, these six colors, really, uh, and finishing the drawing, that was a tremendous uh, session. All right, so our last color for the day is going to be violet. And uh, violet is uh, equal amounts of blue and red. So in this case, uh, we're not using yellow, and it won't cancel. Uh, we don't have to use more of it that, than normal, like not three of these, I'm thinking equal amounts. So if we take two good scoops of the blue to start with, and we put it over here on the card, two good scoops of the blue, and then we're going to take, uh, we got to clean out a brush because we'll pollute the red if we don't do this right, and we may have to, in the next class after you, people are going to use these uh, primary colors, all right? And so you have to keep them pure if you can. And we're going to do the same thing here with our uh, red. We're going to take two good scoops of it, try to put it in there, you know, right there, I guess. And then if you are, uh, you should pick away from the edges of the puddle, not right out of the middle of it uh, when you're mixing these colors. Uh, other people will have to use these. Okay, the color we're looking for is grape jelly purple. If you get it, if it looks reddish brown, you got to put more blue in it. If it looks so dark navy blue, uh, then you need to put more red into it. So let's see what I get. Almost always, we come out with a red violet, which is kind of a reddish brown color. Almost never do we get that grape jelly purple in the first try. Uh, I've got kind of a reddish brown color here. I've got to clean off this. Uh, my brush is getting soggy there. Okay, so the way I see it, I'm probably going to have to add uh, some more, uh, I'm going to say some blue to this. It looks like it's gone a little bit off to the red end. And so you're constantly adjusting your color. So I'm going to take uh, probably a pretty good scoop of this. And I'm going to put it in here. And I should, um, the target color is great jelly purple. And now I can see it changing right here in front of me. Now I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera or not, but I can see it. And so I'm getting my grape jelly purple, but I've got to make sure I get all of the strands of the color scraped into the middle. Alright. Alright. Okay, let's 
let's see what we're doing here. That looks pretty good. Now my brush is kind of fully loaded, but I'm going to go ahead and use it anyway. We're going to put this into this shape right here. Uh, it looks like it says shape 3, but whatever that shape is, it doesn't really need a number. But So you might have noticed we're always trying to keep the requirements, the primary colors, the secondary colors, the tertiary colors, which we'll be making in our next session, all touching each other on the painting project. So you can describe what you were doing to somebody. You could uh, initially you could say, oh well these are all my primary colors or oh these are all my secondary colors and so forth. Oh, that, that caught me off guard. I mean just the end of a period there. That means we've been working for about 40 minutes. So I'm going to continue finishing up what I've got going here. We'll quickly review and then that will be the session for the day. And a lot of progress has been made here today. I've got to say I'm pretty impressed. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, let's see what we got. I'm going to keep... I may have to go back and touch up parts of this. However, it's a good painting so far. So when you're making progress early on, it's a, it's a thing of beauty. And at this point, you know, after we've been through the design unit and the drawing unit, you all should have some skills by now in order to create a more complicated piece of artwork. Okay, there is my violet, and I gotta say, I'm pretty satisfied with it. Okay, let's uh, see what we have created so far today. We'll remove these, and this is what we have done. And so, if you're keeping up with the project at this point like that, you're doing a fantastic job and uh, I appreciate your efforts and it looks like we are going to be out of time today so clean up your paint brushes and put them back where they came from please make sure you dump your nasty rinse water into the buckets don't put it down the sink you'll stop my sink up alright that's good have a nice day bye